Hi, everybody. We're um, happy to have uh, have you here online tonight um, uh, with from the Friends of the DAO. Uh, we have got a good program um, for you. Uh, and it just kind of feels like old times that we've just kind of gone back about a year and a half or so to the time when we did our online programs uh, all summer long. We were fortunately up at the center, but uh, we are, we, I've got a little bit of some update about um, what's happening and why we are online and not on, um, not on, uh, not right up at the hill again tonight. So I'd first of all like to acknowledge that um, um, I'm in Brentwood Bay and I am on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish and uh, Lekwungen speaking people who are custody, who have custody of this land up on the Saanich Peninsula with the Wasanic Nation, who are Sinchothan speaking um, people. And that it is uh, that we are very happy to be able to work up at the hill um, as well, who is within that territory. Um, up on the hill known as Watixis with the uh, for the Wasanic Nation, and that we are in uh, collaboration and discussion with um, how we can uh, work together to make uh, to have uh, wonderful times with the sky um, up there at this at the same time. So um, uh, thank you very much for coming in coming in this evening. Um, what we're going to do tonight is to have a few little announcements and a welcome of some of the people that are going to be on this evening. And then uh, Don Moffat is going to do a what's up in the sky um, for just a little bit and tell us a little bit about what's going on. And then Calvin, uh, our, uh, our coordinator of school programs, uh, is going to be talking very specifically tonight about doing a little bit of a virtual tour um, that would be done if we were if we were up on the hill of the mirror and the model uh, that is the 1915 model for the for the uh, for the telescope. And he's also got the uh, virtual uh, video that is uh, that shows the cleaning of the teles of the telescope mirror. So that's kind of a little bit different. If you've not seen that before, then uh, then you'll then you'll get a chance to see that. And then um, after that, we have uh, an old friend. Well, he's not, he's not old, but he's been around for a little while with us. Um, Aaron Bannister, who's going to be doing the Ask an Astronomer segment that we used to um, that we that we did before, um, and then uh, at eight o'clock, uh, Dr. Tyrone Woods is going to be coming in and doing uh, his speech or his, his presentation on uh, the Castor. Uh, Canadian Space Telescope. And then at the end of the evening, we're going to bring back a segment that we haven't done for a little while with uh, David Lee, David Payne, uh, and Brock Johnson on some of our gorgeous astro images that were taken uh, at some point during the summer, uh, the summer months. So the first thing I think I want to um, just talk about a little bit is why we are online is um, uh, a year ago, uh, many of you will remember that the there was a, a huge river of um, uh, atmospheric river that came in and uh, we had tremendous uh, storms and and uh, water damage. Um, and one of the things that did uh, that was a problem was a little part of the road on the on the on the hill side um, just uh, uh, kind of caved caved away a little bit. Not anything that was really too dangerous at that point. It was all year long. It has been just simply um, put uh, with bollards around the the edges, and it wasn't a problem. And then they spent the year kind of doing uh, doing surveys and uh, uh, geological surveys, all, all that kind of thing, in order to get it done. And then finally, about uh, about maybe five weeks ago now, um, they started to actually do the reconstruction of the road. Um, and what they had to do with that was to actually take away a section of the right-hand side of the road going up the hill um, in order to uh, to kind of infill what had been what had been damaged. And so there wasn't a great deal of space. We were down to one to one lane with um, lights on both on both edges and um, and uh, enough room, really, honestly, only for a fire truck to get up. And that was it. It was a very it was a very a thin little little road that was up in there. Um, and uh, then just because of the weather 
uh, because of the the night of, of being there in the night without any lights on, uh, the NRC um, uh, decided that it was to the to the best of everybody's safety if the road simply was closed until the major the majority of the road was fixed, and that should be by the end of December. Um, it may not be fully uh, fully paved by uh, by that time, not until the springtime, but it still will be totally usable. And so we're going to, so we, we decided to actually close the center to the public and uh, to for, for our star parties. And we've also actually closed the center to our star party, uh, not star party, sorry, our school tours and community tours that we uh, that we were doing up at the Hill. Um, regretfully, but that we, I mean, safety is the number one factor. So uh, we were fully in support of this. Um, so we've gone online and we will be uh, online uh, this month. And then following next month, we're also going to be having another, um, another star party on December the 17th. And that will be our solstice star party that we have had over the past uh, few years. And uh, we are very happy to have um, our, uh, our, our resident um, amazing Oak Bay, uh, uh, Oak Bay student, Nathan uh, Hellner Messelman, who is going to be, uh, sorry, not Oak Bay, I'm sorry, it's Reynolds School that he's at. And he's going to be giving our presentation on uh, in on September, the, on December the 17th, called Our Place in the Cosmos. And we're happy, we're going to be happy to have him. So um, I don't know whether there's any other announcements that have to be made. Um, uh, could I, maybe Don, could I uh, pass it over to you to give something about the gift shop? Sure thing. Yeah. So thanks, Laurie. And it's always interesting times these days, isn't it? Uh, the world keeps throwing things at us, but uh, we'll, we'll, we, uh, we can survive. So yes, yeah, so this is the beginning of the What's Up portion. And we used to call it What's Up in the Sky, but we're also interested in What's Up in the Gift Shop. And uh, usually we have Amy here to, to give her side of it. And she does this part much better. She has great props from the gift shop and so on, but I don't have them with me tonight. So I'm just going to have to tell you a little bit about it. But uh, as she, I'm just going to quote her here in her message. It says, with the holidays coming, if you're interested in purchasing something from the gift shop, don't be discouraged because the hill is closed. We can bring your order to you. Within reason, of course. Uh, you can visit our online shop through our website and place your order. So if you're local to Victoria, we will drop off your order. And if you're further away, there's still lots of time for a mail order. And highlights in the gift shop this season, as usual, are the Celestial Buddies. And uh, we now have the Pluto and uh, Sharon Buddy pairs, and they're so cute, as she notes, uh, very cute. And we also have a wide selection of books for many age ranges. Okay, so now with, uh, with what's up in the sky. Um, so just the usual things about sunset and twilight and so on. Uh, sunrises at 7.37 a.m. today here in Victoria with astronomical twilight starting at 5.45 a.m. Sunset was at uh, 4.23 p.m. and astronomical twilight ended at 6.16 p.m. And so notably, this is a time of the year when darkness comes much uh, comes early much faster than expected partly due to both the change in time near the beginning of November, uh, but also due to the rapidly changing sunset times. And those rapidly changing sunset times have kept much the same constellations visible uh, as they appear just after sunset. And so November is a time when you can see both summer and winter constellations over the course of an evening. And I'm just going to try to share my screen here and just share. Okay. So you should actually uh, see Stellarium here now. And this is kind of an all sky view. And I'm just going to try to move things around a little bit. And so this is just before sunset. And now I'm going to just put it uh, just after sunset into twilight. And you can see, in fact, that uh, there's the star Vega from the summer sky. I'll throw some constellations on here as well. And uh, you can also see Cygnus and so on. And so the summer triangle is actually just still visible on the on the horizon there, just into the twilight. And there you can see as we get a little bit later in the evening, just at the end of astronomical twilight or near the end of astronomical twilight, there's uh, there's Vega and Altair, and Deneb is up here. Probably misnamed Altair as Deneb there a second ago, but that's okay. And 
so let's just have a little look at this. Uh, you can actually see that you can actually see most of the summer sections of the of the Milky Way that are available to us at this latitude, as well as getting into the winter uh, sections of the Milky Way. So this is just after six, and as the evening goes on, of course, we can get into more sections of the winter Milky Way, and you can see beautiful Mars up there with this distinctive color near Aldebaran. You can compare their colors, both are reddish, and also Betelgeuse down here. So it'd be kind of an interesting little project just to compare the colors of all of these three reddish objects. Okay, a little bit of uh, a little bit of an easy eyeball astronomy that you can do. And what I'm going to try to do here, and hopefully I don't mess things up. I, you know, you know me. I like to mess things up in this presentation. You can see the constellation Andromeda here. With uh, if I can just hopefully move this over here a little bit with the square of Pegasus. And then if you look at kind of the upper left hand star in the square and go over two stars and then up two stars here, you can see the Andromeda galaxy. So it's actually right overhead at this time of the year. And so it's prime time for looking at that, especially around now when the when we don't have much of a, a moon in the sky. So, OK, so uh, so just a, a little note here, too. Uh, and by the way, you can see the Andromeda galaxy with your eye or binoculars or a telescope. And so it's a bit of a challenge object. It's probably the most distant thing you'll ever see with your eye and the oldest light ever to hit uh, the retinas of your eye unaided. All right. So um, so just a little note here, too, that the rapidly changing sunset time also means that many people are unprepared for earlier darkness, resulting in more accidents. So if you're out in a boat, as a pedestrian or a cyclist, uh, make sure that you wear lights and reflective clothing. And if you're driving, keep your eyes peeled. And in fact, um, the earliest sunset in Victoria is not on the winter solstice, as you might expect, but instead occurs around December 7th at 4.18 p.m. So we're actually getting pretty close to that time, only about five minutes out, and stays at that time for about a week. And the latest sunrise occurs around New Year's. And these are offset from um, the solstice by approximately two weeks due to the elliptical nature of the Earth's orbit. And uh, you can, if you want to prove that for yourself, go to timeanddate.com and look up the times for Victoria or wherever you're located. So the moon phase right now is a waxing crescent as new moon was on November 23rd. And if you're looking at a cur uh, current picture of the Earth from Artemis, as many of us have been doing online, you'll know that, notice that the Earth appears nearly full. And that's because, of course, of the different vantage points, with the Moon being nearly on a line between the Earth and the Sun. And so the phase of the Earth and the Moon are always opposite in this way, depending on which celestial body you're near or standing on. And so that's kind of fun to think about when you're looking at, uh, uh, say, a nearly full Moon. If, you're stand, if you imagine standing or orbiting the Moon, Looking back at the Earth, the uh, the the Earth would be like a, like a crescent. Okay, so the uh, the first quarter moon is on November thirtieth, and the full moon is on December seventh, and third quarter is on December sixteenth, and then we'll have a new moon again on December twenty third. And the reason I'm mentioning all of these phases, especially the last one, is because uh, for those of you who might be considering. Uh, getting a telescope or a new telescope or pre presenting a telescope as a gift to somebody at around Christmas time, uh, then uh, I, I really hope that, uh, that you consider looking at the moon as a first target because it, it's, a great, it's a great thing to look at. And on the subject of that, I'm just going to share this article that I also put on our Facebook page and hopefully I can bring it up here. Um, let's see here, I don't seem to have it up. Of course, I always have to have a little bit of a technical problem for this. Let me just try this again. And, and that's not doing it. Just bear with me, folks. And OK, so now here we go. I'll figure this out someday. So what we're looking at here is an article called Hobby Killers, What Tel Telescopes Not to Buy. And and so uh, you don't want this to happen, of course, to get that sort of cheapy uh, uh, or give the, the cheapo uh, department store type telescope that uh, has a, uh, purports to have a lot of magnification, but is actually very skinny. 
it doesn't gather much light and so these are usually quite unstable they're on rickety mountain uh, mountings and uh, they won't be satisfying and might end up discouraging some uh, somebody and you also don't want to go to the other extreme you don't want to give a super duper massive telescope which many experienced amateur astronomers would enjoy of course but which might be uh, just too unwieldy to use on a regular basis and uh, and so especially um, here's one of those uh, complicated sort of skinny telescopes uh, you might want to consider giving something more like this which is a, a tabletop telescope especially for a small child and and so these are also relatively inexpensive now there you can often find one for under five hundred dollars sometimes starting around uh two fifty or three hundred dollars which is which is terrific this model here is a four and a half inch telescope and i do encourage you to uh to try canadian distributors for these telescopes they're uh you might if you're lucky they're hard to find in stock right now because they're proving very popular but um if you don't mind waiting for, for for a Canadian distributor, I'm sure you can get one very soon into the new year. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I think Quirky Science here in Victoria, who are great supporters of the RESC and our efforts, uh, they actually have a nice compact six inch telescope, but it's currently back ordered. So that's another option. So I uh, encourage you to kind of shop around Canadian first if you can here. Also, okay, so uh, let's just talk about a few other things. I'll just stop this share. And so what are the planets doing? So Venus is not currently visible in the evening sky, but it will be in the coming months. And Mars rises at 4.56 p.m., so just after sunset, and it's easy to see in the eastern sky and is up for the rest of the evening. And Jupiter rises before sunset and sets at about 1.41 a.m. currently. And Saturn rises before sunset and sets at 10.06. So come Christmas time, actually, uh, all of those will be visible, although Saturn will be sinking down low into the southwestern sky. But uh, hopefully the, the people receiving their first telescope for Christmas will enjoy a glimpse of Saturn. So that, that's uh, something to look forward to for that. So some other notable events, uh, meteors and meteor showers have been in the news lately, especially with a small asteroid exploding over Canada on November 19th. Uh, and the significant thing for this was that it was detected before it hit the atmosphere, despite being only about a meter in size. And its orbit was plotted and, and alerts went out electronically before it hit. So this is pretty amazing. And it shows that NASA's early warning system is really starting to work well. and. Uh, so that's tr that's actually a little bit reassuring uh, that uh, they're really getting that in good shape. And so for me, uh, though, one of the highlights of this year uh, relates to meteors and so on, and that's the Geminids. And this peaks on the night of uh, what I have Wednesday the 15th here. And uh, I always enjoy these bright, colorful meteors, and they're also slower moving than the August Perseids as the shower particles essentially have to kind of catch up with the Earth a little bit rather than hitting us from the direction we're moving into. So if you want to think about this a little bit, it's a bit like the difference between driving along slowly and uh, snowflakes hitting your windshield, which would be the uh, in front of you, which would be like the Perseids, versus maybe some of them hitting the back window of the car. So, they, uh, so the, the impact velocity is a little bit lower. And it's, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's kind of that effect. And so what I really like about this is that if you're out observing with somebody and somebody goes, wow, look at that one. With these, you usually actually have time to turn your head and see it. So, <laughs> so, that's, uh, so that's kind of fun. So I'm just going to do a little bit of an Artemis update. So Artemis, uh, Artemis 1, there's going to be more Artemises, I guess we can say, in the future. Artemis 1 made its closest approach to the moon on November 21st, coming within 130 kilometers of the lunar surface. And its orbit swings out as far as 64,000 kilometers from the moon. And for perspective, the moon is about as wide as the continental United States, about 3,500 kilometers. And the Earth is about uh, 12,700 kilometers in diameter. So that makes the moon just a little bit over a quarter the width of the Earth. And if you want to imagine what it's, uh, uh, just put this all in perspective, uh, the, the moon, uh, you could easily cover up the moon with your thumb held at arm's length. 
Uh, but you could also do that from the moon, looking back at the Earth, and and certainly astronauts have actually done that. And uh, and so so even from that distance, the uh, uh, or from that relatively close distance celestially, uh, it's easy to cover up the Earth. And uh, so Artemis has been almost completely successful. It uh, it did have some telemetry problems at one point. Uh, but uh, probably the, the biggest hiccup, it was not directly related to that spacecraft, but it also launched 10 small CubeSats uh, just after launch, and only four of those are actually still operating at the last time I checked. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, two that are not currently operating are the NASA's NEA Scout, which is a really cool little uh, package which involved a solar sail that was supposed to sprout out. And this thing was going to, to sort of zoom off towards a, an asteroid and take close up photos. And they're hoping to start building many of these things to directly survey uh, uh, a lot of asteroids at a very low cost. But they had some problems with that and unfortunately they've lost contact. And uh, the other one that was really quite interesting that at least to me, was uh, was one of Japan's uh, efforts, a little CubeSat called, and I'll probably mispronounce this, but Omotenashi, which is a tiny lunar lander. And Omotenashi means hospitality in Japanese. And, all, and as we all know, uh, space is very inhospitable, so we actually wish them best luck next time. Maybe make space a little bit more hospitable. And I'm just going to double check. I might have a... I'm not sure. Yes, I think I actually do have a little movie of how that was supposed to work. And okay, I think this is it. All right. And so it's just a little 10 second movie, but it was supposed to use a solid rocker, rocket booster to break its fall. And this thing was about the, the size of a big uh, table, uh, sort of a coffee table book, maybe a bit thicker about... Uh, maybe about 10 centimeters thick. But anyways, keep that in mind as it comes down here. And so unfortunately, they had some telemetry problems and they're gonna to have to try again another time. But one of the beauties of these little CubeSats is that, is that they're very inexpensive to try out. And so a lot of them are quite experimental. And, uh, and so uh, I think they're probably gonna try again and hopefully they'll be successful next time. And I just want to give a little plug here to Fraser Kane's universetoday.com because uh, Fraser uh, Kane is a fellow who's been providing terrific space information, space news since about 1999. And he's a great supporter of ours here too. And uh, so I encourage you to go to universetoday.com to, to follow along with what's going on and uh, with the Artemis and other things. And so Artemis is, uh, planned, is, is apparently going to return to the Earth on December 11th. Uh, just for perspective here, the first mission to the moon with people on board was 54, 54 Decembers ago, 1968, when there was a very daring test to see if they could get there and back, even though they didn't land. And uh, they, were, they were, for perspective, in a lunar orbit uh, that was about 100, uh, 112 kilometers off the lunar surface, a, a circular orbit, unlike Artemis's. Uh, which is, as I noted, came as close as uh, about 130 kilometers, but went much further out. And one of the difficulties in orbiting the moon is that, uh, especially that close, is that the mass is unevenly distributed beneath the surface, causing the orbiting spacecraft to dip and rise uh, when near the moon, making orbit calculations uh, very difficult. And the mathematician in charge of many of those calculations for Apollo 8 was a 25-year-old woman by the name of Poppy Northcutt, who was invited by the Royal BC Museum to speak at an IMAX presentation on the Apollo missions um, uh, a few years back. And she noted during that talk that she had they had to constantly update their calculations uh, because the spacecraft was unexpectedly going up and down as it was orbiting the moon. So with people on board, it wasn't just an un uncrewed spacecraft. So imagine how much pressure that was to be doing that. And Poppy is uh, uh, still lives in Texas, by the way, and uh, she's now a semi-retired lawyer. And I just want to say about that, that this is really the mission that it, uh, inspired me to get interested in astronomy. I was a preschool kid at the time, 
And I'm really hoping that there's young kids uh, kind of like me at that age who are being really inspired by, by Artemis right now. So just a little bit more on those anomalies. And I'm going to see if I can, I'm, risk, I'm pressing my luck here with, with this, but I'm going to see if I can share this again. And I'm going to show you uh, a more recent map of those lunar gravitational field anomalies. And this is from the NASA GRAIL mission in 2012. And so here we go. And see if I can share my screen. This is quite colorful. So it's false colors, of course, but you can get the idea from this. And so uh, this is so this is show. I, I don't know the actual. Here's the color scheme at the top here. But you can see a bit of a scale on it. It says uh, small m and g. And this is thousandths of a centimeter per second squared. So we think of the gravitational acceleration on the Earth as been, uh, being measured at the, at the surface is 9.8 meters per second squared. So this is variations in a very small amount here, but it's enough that it's really important for the navigation of the spacecraft. And I'm just going to ask you a question here. I know you can't respond to me directly, but maybe some people in the chat here on Zoom, if you remember, you can. But does anybody know off the top of your head what the G in MG stands for? Okay, give you a second. I see Lori's looking puzzled. I think I've stumped Lori, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> She's laughing. Okay, they're actually Milli Galileos, which is great. I didn't know until today that yeah she's throwing her hand up it's i didn't know today that Gal galileo had a uh, had a unit named after him but what an appropriate thing for it because of course with his uh with his book uh, um, the starry messenger he presented his his first observation showing that the, the surface of the moon was not uniform okay so i'm going to post some of these links to the facebook page a little bit later but i encourage you to check that out and uh, let me see. So uh, just a reminder that in 1968, they didn't have a map like this. So it was kind of doing it on the fly to see what would happen. So uh, those, <laughs> those first crews are just incredibly brave. And uh, so even returning from, and so returning from low Earth, uh, low lunar orbit really increased the risk. And they had to really plan that last burn to get back to the Earth, which they fortunately did. So a repeat of that orbital mission without a landing will be Artemis II, and that's scheduled for May 2024. And the first landing is scheduled for some time in 2025. And unfortunately, I don't have an estimate of the month for that at the moment. And one more thing, I don't know if any of you have noticed this, but I, I was enjoying the live feeds on, on YouTube of Artemis. And I found it enjoyable and relaxing and listening to the music and all that. But after a while, I kind of suspected something was up with these live feeds because after about an hour or so, I noticed I wasn't seeing the dark side of the moon. I wasn't seeing the moon in shadow. So I think this, uh, it was like, you know, air quotes, live feed, but we were seeing sort of a continuous view of the lit portion of the moon. We were, weren't seeing the spacecraft going around and showing the dark side of the moon. So anyways. Uh, one more thing today, and uh, then I'll be done. I just want to mention that it, uh, as far as from what I can tell, it appears that uh, there was a successful launch of a cargo mission to the space station that's carrying a uh, first satellite from the University of Victoria. And this has a great tie-in to efforts at the DAO because this little satellite is actually for astronomical calibration purposes. And it's very appropriate for the West Coast in that it's called Orcasat. And again, I'll post, post some links to this, including a very good Times Colonist article about this from a little while ago. And the idea is that they're going to use this thing. They're going to launch it from the space station with a little spring. It's, I don't know if it's going to make a boing sound. Probably not because it's space. But it's going to launch this into low Earth orbit. And it's going to uh, send... I think from what I understand, maybe I have this wrong, but it's going to send laser signals down or measure, probably measure them coming up from the earth and try to measure, essentially determine the filtration effect of the earth's atmosphere. Because one of the things they would like to do with the, with the giant telescopes is better calibrate how much light they're losing as it comes in from distant stars and galaxies and planets. 
And so this will help them calibrate their, the instruments, including uh, instruments like Altair and so on. So again, I'll post uh, some more links on Facebook later. So, um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully I haven't put you all to sleep with all these things, but uh, I'll just send it back to, uh, to Lori and Calvin. And so thanks and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, Dawn. I, every time you do some of this kind of thing, I, I learn a whole bunch more that I absolutely did not know before. So that's just, that's amazing. Um, I'm and, amazed that I stumped you, so. Uh, no, I did not. I did, sorry. How many other people knew that there was a a, a measurement called a Galilei, a Galilean? I did not. I did not at all. <laughs> no, no, never heard of it before. So uh, yeah, but it, it seems to be pretty small. Let's put it that way, right? The, the measurements were pretty small. Um, so now uh, what we're going to do is um, move over with uh, Calvin over to a little bit of some uh, some information that if you were if we were up at the center, some of the some people that were that come up for our star party get uh, a nice tour of the dome and a tour of the telescope, the whole thing. And uh, because we can't do that, we're just going to just center on um, a couple of the things that we have in our uh, in the lobby. Um, because probably we would be in the lobby tonight if we were in there because it's such a miserable night out there. Um, and uh, and so I'm going to turn it back over to Calvin and um, you have about 15 minutes or so, Calvin, if sure. you want to just do that timing. All right. Thanks, Lori. Um, yes. So this we'll do sort of like a virtual tour using the virtual tour that Aaron Bannister has um, created for us. Um, so thanks for that, Aaron. Uh, I will show it now. So for uh, this part of the virtual tour, we will, um, sorry about the gray boxes that are around there. Not sure how to deal with that. Oh, I think they went away. Um, this is uh, inside the lobby. If you aren't familiar with it, this is in the center of the universe, the visitor center. And what we are looking at right here is a 10 to 1 scale model of, um, or maybe a 1 to 10 scale model of the telescope, um, of the Plaskett telescope. And this is, uh, this is not uh, just some model that was built to show off in the museum. Um, I believe if I click on this picture here, it shows a photograph here. Uh, I believe this is 1915. Um, they built the model to show how the actual telescope would work. So all the um, parts that would move on the telescope can also move on this model. Uh, you can uh, see that there's uh, the axis of the telescope that can rotate around. Uh, if I zoom in a bit, you might even see that there are some wheels on the dome, so the whole dome can rotate around. Uh, you can also see that there is a person here for scale on this observation platform. Uh, and uh, that is how astronomers used to be able to get up to the top of the telescope. This um, observation platform here would be able to raise up um, to the top of the telescope. And I believe we can actually get another view. If I click here, it will take us to the inside of the model, which I think is pretty neat. Um, so this is on like the second floor uh, if I turn it around here, we can see the um, telescope. This is not quite the height. This would be like if you were crouching down and looking around is about what the um, what the scale looks like here. And I'll just uh, open this. Okay, this is an actual photograph of the telescope, of uh, the real telescope um, that we can perhaps show, do a virtual tour of for our next uh, uh, star party. Uh, I can rotate this around a bit. Uh, so up here is that observation platform that you can't quite see that well because it's all painted black, um, but there it is there. So uh, this telescope, uh, just like all telescopes, it's got a large uh, mirror for collecting light and they are just big light collecting buckets. Uh, so at the bottom of the tube is a mirror. And uh, I can show you the original mirror that went in the telescope. Once I click around some more here um, and take a view this way. 
Uh, so there, I guess we've got a, a view of the observation platform there. Now, uh, I want to take you over to the mirror. So what I can do here is I can move us around. And in the entrance here is where the original mirror sits. And I'll just go over to the front of the mirror, the shiny side. So just like any good old mirror, it is a uh, very, very smooth pane of glass with a uh, thin coating of aluminum on it to make it reflective. So it reflects light back very well. Um, pane is probably not a very good description of it because of how thick the piece of glass is. Um, it's like uh, maybe eight or 12 inches uh, in thick, made out of glass. And uh, I'll just show around here. Uh, you can also see that there's a hole in the middle of it. Yeah, this is a great, great uh, front on shot of it. Um, and so the mirror, uh, unlike typical mirrors, is very slightly curved uh, concave uh, inward so that it actually focuses light that uh, hits it. So light from a star goes all the way down onto the mirror, it reflects back up, but then focuses to a point. And actually there's another mirror, a secondary mirror that reflects the light backwards back through that hole. And then that is where you'd put uh, an eyepiece or in the case of this telescope, uh, a camera. So we'll just uh, move around to the back side of the mirror. And uh, you can, sort of see maybe a dark green kind of color about it. And actually when you are standing back here, you can see of course through the glass, but then also through a little bit through the um, aluminum coating, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, and uh, there's also some air bubbles that are trapped inside. Uh, so this glass is made out of the same glass that wine bottles are made out of and uh, was originally made over 100 years ago uh, in Belgium. They made the blank for it, so just the slab of glass. And uh, then it was sent to Pittsburgh where a lens crafter ground down uh, that uh, front side of it to give it that very perfect shape that it needs to be in, that uh, concave shape. And it's um, been polished, I think, for about two years before being shipped to Victoria and then finally being uh, brought up to the telescope. So the aluminum on the mirror is, uh, wait, I'll just uh, move us around to the front again. The aluminum on the mirror is uh, really important that it stays as shiny as possible. And uh, over time, it gets less shiny. Um, and astronomers want to collect as many photons as possible. So um, they always need to keep this shiny. So. Um, Every few years, they actually need to put a new, uh, remove an old the old surface and put a new uh, layer of aluminum on it. And there is a video that I can play that shows that process. I'm gonna tab over to that video. And Don, if you want to um, pop on. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can bring you up while I'm looking at this view. Well, hopefully you can just hear me. I'm going to do my best. I can definitely hear you. I'm actually I'm not sure how to see. This is I got two jobs at the same time to do here. <laughs> Maybe I'll stop sharing for a split second, uh, then uh, bring it on, and then share. Yeah, that's that's pretty slow to do. Okay, so now uh we're looking at this video and then i'm gonna hit play don you can just talk about whatever is going on because this is actually kind of sure. new for me <laughs> okay so it starts off they have to move a platform underneath the base of the telescope and then unbolt the the mirror cell and then gently lower it down so that it clears the base of the telescope and so you can see that's what they're doing there it's kind of a, a semicircle, and uh they don't really move this fast in reality, I don't think, but, uh, but anyways. <laughs> uh, so it's a little crew of people, and it, uh, my understanding is that this takes a couple of days in total. Uh, I think we're having a bit of streaming problems here, but how's oh, it looking? Yeah. Your... yeah, sorry, I'm just, yeah, um, it's uh, not 
buffering. Sure. And one thing to keep in mind while watching all of this is that they thought of this when they're designing the entire dome because bits and pieces of the dome are involved in the entire process. They don't do the aluminizing process upstairs, they do it downstairs. So they had to, when planning all of this, they had to figure how to get the telescope, how to get the telescope apart so that it wouldn't fall down when it was unweighted. Um, when they took the mirror out, which uh, weighs a couple of tons and plus more with, there it is, you can see it's starting to come off and they pulled it back there uh, there is a post that actually is a jack that goes up the other side and they pin it in place kind of like a car jack and that supports the counterweight on the other side and that's why the, the telescope didn't just flop over onto its side. So it's like, basically like a big seesaw. So if you take two or three tons out, the whole thing would go flipping over otherwise. And now they pick it up with a crane oh, well, attached the crane to, the, to the roof. Yeah, on the, on the uh, dome itself. That's handy. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's on the dome itself. You can go up and see that. And they've just taken the, the floor apart and uh, lowered it downstairs. And they've applied some chemicals to uh, take the coating off. And you notice that they're wearing hazmat suits there. It's, uh, they don't want to be inhaling any of this stuff or uh, getting it on them. And then they've got to clean out the inside of the vacuum chamber over there and the top flips over like that and then they gotta pick it up again after they've done all the cleaning and gently lower it into part of the chamber so now you can see the coatings off it's just the ceramic and this is a glass ceramic kind of like a coffee cup or teacup mm -hmm. and they they replace the mirror with this because uh, it doesn't expand and contract as much as plate glass does and so the temperature variations during the night would normally affect uh, the, the shape of the mirror a little bit and mess up the observations with the focus. And so by switching to a glass ceramic, they can avoid that problem. So here they are cleaning everything and they're, they're vaporizing some aluminum. Very in cool shot. You can actually see through the side. And uh, But after a while, you wouldn't be able to see in through the side because they, uh, it'll get aluminum on the inside of the, the chamber. And it's, uh, they actually had to pump out the air in order to do that. And just as a historical side here too, this was designed by a very famous sort of second generation of staff members, uh, Dr. Andrew McKellar, who uh, made some brilliant discoveries around this time, uh, dis discovering uh, molecules in between the stars, uh, uh, carbon-based molecules, and also measuring their temperatures two degrees above absolute zero. Uh, far, uh, this is before the Big Bang Theory was developed, and uh, anyways, he designed this chamber, and to and it was actually built here in Victoria, down in Esquimalt, and it was used during the Second World War to illuminize mirrors for searchlights and also for the communication reflectors that used on Navy ships. You've seen probably in old movies where they have the flaps that go up and down as they as they do Morse code or send different types of code. And uh, so they, he was involved with helping to illuminize those. So it was, has a historic role in the Canadian war effort, the Allied war effort as well. And part of his job along with a colleague was also teaching armed forces personnel how to maintain the surfaces of these illuminized mirrors and when to get it redone. And so that was uh, 1940, 41. So it was actually kind of a early application of astron of technology developed for astronomy right here at the DAO. So that's part of the DAO's role in the Second World War. That's fascinating, Don. Um, so before this, before you said McKellar designed this, this yeah. process, um, how was it re-illuminized or re-silvered yeah. previously? So so they, they did use a, a silver concoc a concoction, and apparently in order to get it just right, they actually had to use sugar and so uh, and, and, and a few other secret ingredients. It was kind of like, you know, uh, it was kind of like the recipe for, uh, you know, seven herbs and spices, right? Like they had, they didn't, they, they weren't telling everybody how they did this, but they would send a bill to, to Ottawa uh, every few, every six months or however often they had to do it. And this is one of the hassles of silver is that they had to redo it constantly because it would tarnish very quickly. 
And, and so Ottawa kept getting these bills for aluminum and alcohol, I think that was part of it. I guess they use that for cleaning. Um, aluminum, aluminum, pardon me, silver uh, and uh, alcohol and rock candy. And so apparently there was a letter sent to Victoria at the DAO saying, what kind of parties are you having there every few months? Like, why, are you, <laughs> why do you need so much candy? So, uh, so anyways, they got rid of that hassle with this new aluminizing process. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> Uh, so that video um, that we just watched, and also um, and also the virtual tour, um, that can be found on our website, centeroftheuniverse.org slash virtual dash tour. Um, the video, I believe, was made by folks at the NRC, uh, Greg Nispel or something, and some others, and, uh, and the virtual tour was made by Aaron Bannister. Uh, so thanks to those folks. Um, uh, that's about all I have to say. Perhaps next uh, time we do this virtual tour, I can actually I'll go into the to the virtual dome uh, and talk about some things there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Don, for that brilliant insight. Yeah, sure. And I actually uh, just discovered a lot of that stuff very recently. And as I was saying before we started, I wish I had known a lot of that about the role uh, they played in the Second World War before I gave thousands of dome tours. But um, but we're, we will be producing, we are in the process of producing some pages for the uh, Virtual Museum of Canada. I believe, I'm not sure that's the correct name anymore, but about the history, uh, about the history of the observatory. And I was actually writing a section on the World War II role of the observatory and the astronomers. And we'll go into more detail about all of this in that. That's something to look for in the future, near future. So thanks to Dennis Crabtree for organizing all of that. Right on, and yeah, and thanks, Don. If I if I can just uh, elaborate a little bit on that, Don. Yes, we uh, FDAO successfully won a grant from the Canadian History Museum, um, and uh, the Canadian History Museum has this heritage site where they invite people to contribute websites about um, uh, Canadian heritage and we we won one of those and the, it's going to be about the uh, community around um, the community around DAO in the early part of the century and it's going to talk all about these these things and it'll be it'll be available nationally probably by the end of this year thanks Ben Thank you to uh, Calvin and to Don and uh, Ben for helping out with that segment. And we're going to uh, uh, now say hi to uh, Aaron Bannister. Um, Aaron was uh, a, there he is, uh, was uh, very much a part of our DAO family and our FDAO family for a very long time. And then, um, then has kind of just um, moved over to being a new dad. And so <laughs> he's he's got a, a little bit, but we asked him whether or not he'd come on today. And he says, well, he thought he could find 15 minutes, you know, like, <laughs> so thank you, Aaron, for coming on. You're our Ask an Astronomer tonight. Uh, and so right now we have um, uh, Calvin, if you could kind of monitor the people on, on YouTube, if there's any questions sure that they have for... Mm -hmm. uh, for Aaron or if any of the people that are online uh, on our Zoom call, if they'd like to ask anything of Aaron, um, I'm sure that he'd be um, happy to chat away for a little while uh, before we have our speaker. So, all right. Does anybody have, are, are there any questions that are in the, the chat? Um, Don't see any questions in the chat. But, Don't uh, see any questions in the chat. Okay. Yeah, not on YouTube yet. Ah, all right. Oh. Well, <laughs> Okay, well, in the meantime, then I'll uh, say a quick hello and um, say it's great to see all of you again. Uh, yeah, um, after so many years of being part of the uh, FDAO family, uh, I left for a bit to start a family of my own. So I yep. uh, got a beautiful little daughter uh, who's sleeping in the other room there. So can't be too loud and uh, exuberant tonight. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to be uh, back for a little bit here. So Aaron, uh, can you, do you know anything about Sean the Sheep? Not yet. <laughs> I've seen like very few episodes of it, but. Uh... 
so you know that Sean the sheep was is is up in the Artemis. In I the, did not in the know Ar that. Yes, in the art and 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 Snoopy, and they are floating freely in oh my gosh. In, in there to be able to uh, to be there. Sean the sheep is from the uh, is from the European Space Agency, and I guess Snoopy might be from uh, from uh, from NASA. And they also have sense. some Lego people that are there. Uh, a full a full Lego team that is in there uh, for the art of the session. So, yeah. So could you can you uh, can you maybe give a little bit um, give a little bit of some information on um, uh, what's happening maybe with the next Artemis? Do you know about the Artemis two mission that's coming on a little bit more? Uh, to be honest, no. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, surprisingly, having a kid uh, makes it hard to keep up with the space. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, I I know that um, I know that the the uh, European Space Agency just named some astronauts. Oh, fantastic! Uh, and one of them is um, is uh, has um, a prosthetic leg and is uh, kind of representing the uh, the people with disabilities and is going to be working really strongly with the European Space Agency and NASA in order to make sure that people. You know, with a varying a varying uh, disabilities, uh, have a chance to also be up in space and do lots of lots of things too. So he was he was uh, he was on CBC this morning and was was quite interesting to uh, to hear. So That's it's fantastic. coming along, and I know we're having a Canadian astronaut on board mm -hmm. uh, for Artemis um, for Artemis two. So we do have a question in the chat. Um, okay. It might be it's more of like a. A recommendation um, question about product um, telescopes. So the question is that there, um, Tanya Morrison is asking that uh, they're interested in buying uh, a first telescope for their nine-year-old son. Uh, so they're asking what to recommend. Okay. Um, and so I don't know if you um, have any ideas with that. Yeah, I can I can uh, talk a bit there. Um, okay. Yeah. So honestly, I would recommend binoculars rather than a telescope uh, for a first time observer. Um, one, because binoculars are a lot easier to handle. Um, you can get a decent pair of uh, binoculars for a lot cheaper than um, uh, even a small telescope usually. Uh, like I have a nice pair of um, binoculars with like uh, 90 millimeter um, apertures. So um, the lenses at the front are 90 millimeters across. Um, for um, I got them for about seventy bucks, um, and they're they've got all the coatings and everything for uh, less reflection for um, stargazing specifically. Uh, for a nine year old, you'd probably want to go for something a little smaller than that, but you can get a decent aperture size um, uh, quite cheaply, uh, and that way uh, a child or anyone can hold them up to their face and look around just sort of naturally with them. And that is a great way to start exploring the sky. You can see Andromeda a lot better than you can with your naked eye that way. It reveals a whole bunch of cool clusters uh, and some nebulae become visible with, um, with binoculars if you're somewhere decently dark. Um, and um, you can really see sort of the difference between the Milky Way uh, disk and um, looking out of the Milky Way disk and the density of stars that are there. Um, you can get some great views towards the center of the Milky Way if you look towards the south uh, during the summer. And then um, if this sparks some interest and you want to go further with it, then I'd recommend getting something that's just a big mirror in a tube, like a Dobsonian telescope. Um, something that's like eight inches in aperture, uh, but it's just like in a big cardboard tube that you push around to look at different things. That gives you great views of planets, um, great views of some nebulae. Um, and then uh, from there is when you'd want to start going for more fancy stuff like uh, a guided telescope or something you can hook up a camera to, stuff like that. Uh, but you can get a decent like phone camera mount for um, like a Dobsonian telescope for pretty cheaply as well. Uh, a, so six inch is, a six inch is good too, Aaron. I mean, yeah. so you don't even have to go eight inch for a dog. Yeah, six you or can eight go inch. to six inch dog. Absolutely. Yeah. And Dawn was talking about a tabletop one that had been recommended as well. That, like, oh, yeah. Uh, and which is which would be really good for a, a first telescope as well so yeah 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 great those are some good recommendations um you mentioned 
Um, just having the binoculars to uh, simply be able to look around. Um, is hmm. Would you say eventually get a tripod or something, or at that point you should just like get the, start getting the telescope? So it depends on the size of the binoculars. Um, so mine, because they're quite large, they're, they get heavy after a while and it's, it's hard to keep them steady. Um, right. You can either lay down on the ground and look with them, that, that helps quite a bit. Um, or, but if you're wanting to like set them up and then be able to have another person look through them and see the same thing you're looking at, then yeah, a tripod is a pretty good um, purchase. But again, that's pretty cheap. It's like 20, 30 bucks to get a tripod. And usually if you get a pair of uh, binoculars that are made for astronomy, uh, like a Celestron brand, they'll come with a tripod mount as well in them. So you can hook them up to pretty much any camera tripod. Awesome. The Royal Astronomical Society um, Sky News magazine, which is our Canadian magazine for astronomy, um, just a little little push pull therein, is that they always have uh, different um, uh, different little um, articles on buying buying equipment and uh, and if I if I can uh, just I'm sure that there's been two or three articles in the last year. If I can find those um, find those, I can send some links. Um, in there and that would be great to to have a look at those yeah absolutely and again going local and buying local <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah for sure does yeah. anyone else have any other questions for Aaron I don't see any questions um at the we moment. haven't made him work very hard today not at all yeah they're uh, just <laughs> um kicking back um uh, we've still got, I guess, a few minutes, right? We've got uh, just just a couple. That's right. Yeah, uh, four minutes Dr. Or so, is, but, uh, Dr. I'm happy Woods to step back so. for our speaker if if there's mm -hmm. no other questions. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Well, maybe we'll do that, Aaron, and then if you want to just pop out and come back on again when when uh, David uh, and Brock and uh, David Payne are doing some of the beautiful pictures that they have, that uh, you might want to chime in as well in there. So. Sounds thank good. You for, I'll stay on thank the line. you for coming on for us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, great to okay. see everyone again. Look yeah, after that. Great one. to see you too. Yeah. yeah. Take care. <laughs> it's awesome. I'm going to turn the uh, the the Zoom link over to Ben uh, Dorman, our chairperson of the FDAO, and he is going to introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Woods, for coming online uh, for us tonight. Uh, we wish that you could have been up at the center <laughs> with us, but uh, we just had to do another another pivoting on the on the other way. So I'm going to turn it back over to Ben. Yes. Good. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, yes, we're, we're upset that we couldn't be on the hill tonight, although given the weather, perhaps it's yeah. not such a bad thing. Um, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, I lost my power through a falling tree and I'm crossing my fingers. It doesn't happen again tonight. Um, this is an amazing opportunity to hear about Canadian science. Um, I think a lot of people in Victoria don't realize quite what an amazing center um, Victoria is for Canadian astronomy. Scientists across the country are led by people in Victoria, um, unraveling some of the deepest mysteries of the universe, uncovering the birth of the first black holes to hunting for Earth-like planets in our cosmic backyard. A lot of the science of uh, exoplanets, a lot of it was started right right in Victoria. Um, and Tyrone is going to give us another example of cutting edge science that is started in Canada and particularly in Victoria. And I really love the fact that in astronomy, we are so good at um, creating acronyms. <laughs> We're gonna talk about tonight CASTOR, the Cosmological Advanced Survey Telescope for Optical and UV Research which is a new Canadian space telescope project. Um, Kestor will be able to image as sharply as Hubble, but take a look at a much larger area of the sky, um, and particularly in the ultraviolet um, wavelengths that James Webb Space Telescope cannot see, importantly. 
Um, and we're going, and, and also has to be done from space because the atmosphere is absolutely opaque to ultraviolet wavelengths short of about, you know, well, violet. That's why it's called the ultraviolet. <laughs> um, Tyrone is a Plaskett fellow, which means he's one of the um, super uh, fellows at the um, Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. He studies many of the most energetic events in the, in the universe, supernovae and so on, exploding stars. And he also is very keen on um, compa comparing the theories that we have of these objects with observations. He is a science co-lead for CASTOR, that great acronym that I just recited. Um, and he, he has worked in, um, in Europe and in Australia. Did you, did you ever meet my uh, friend, John Latanzio? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. He's a legend. <laughs> I'm sure he is, yes. Right. Um, so he's been, he's been all over the world and back, and here he is to talk to you about Castor. Thank you, Tyrone. Thank you very much, Ben, for the very, very kind introduction. I'll try sharing the screen here, if I may. Thank you. Is that working all right? Can you all see that? One moment. It looks good to me. OK, perfect. All right, so yes, thank you very much for that the great and really thorough introduction. Uh, that's basically the talk. I guess I can stop there. <laughs> Covered most of it. No, I'll go into a little bit more detail. So. Uh, you know, as, as Ben was saying, I, th I don't think a lot of people really, uh, you know, know this, and it's it's largely our fault. You know, when you chalk it up to that sort of Canadian humbleness, we're really, really not so great at, at telling people about just all the amazing things that are happening, not just in Canada, but actually right here in Victoria. Uh, so, you know, up 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 on the hill at, at DAO, the the Dominion Astrophys Astrophysical Observatory, uh, that's actually sort of the, the nerve center, the command center for Canadian astronomy. Uh, you know, all of the, you know, that's where you'll find the um, uh, house there is the, the National Research Council of Canada's Hertzberg Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Center. Uh, and sort of our, our prime directive, our mandate really, uh, is to uh, manage and, and, and allocate time for and, and uh, uh, administrate, is a better term, uh, the various telescope holdings that Canada has around the world, and of course, increasingly now turning our attention to space. Uh, and, you know, part of our mandate is also thinking about what's going to be coming next, what's going to be uh, the key bit of instrumentation, the telescope that we need in order to answer uh, tomorrow's problems. And that sort of brings us to this uh, long gestating idea that's finally starting to, to come to light, as it were, something that you probably haven't heard a lot of uh, in the last uh, little while, but I guarantee you're going to be hearing more and more about it in the next few years, which is CASTOR. Uh, it's a great acronym, as Ben said, because it's it's the French word for beaver, of course, a national symbol of ours, but it's also uh, a star in the night sky, as I suspect a lot of the audience know. <laughs> um, and so uh, sort of to, to understand why we want to uh, carry out this sort of investment, you know, Canada has this great tradition in, in uh, uh, ground-based space telescope, uh, ground-based telescopes, uh, optical and radio telescopes. Why would we want to go to space? So let me see if I can get to the next slide. Uh, you know, it seems like an awfully expensive undertaking. It seems like, uh, you know, an awful lot of effort. What is it that we gain from space? Well, the very, sh very, very short answer is an enormous amount of information. Uh, and there, there are two main sort of reasons for this. They both both have to do in one way or another with, uh, with our atmosphere, uh, which is, you know, really great for humans that we have it. Very thankful we should take better care of it. Uh, but, you know, very, very annoying sometimes if you're trying to trying to do astronomy, if you're trying to get really precise astronomical measurements. And the two reasons have to do with what we can see when we don't have to look through our atmosphere anymore and how well we can see it. So, you know, this is you know, not just a tribute to, to Pink Floyd, of course, and Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, if we are shine white light through a prism, it has this amazing property that you know, the constituent photons in that beam of light have different energies. And those energies, these little packets of energy, will be slowed and their path bent through the prism in a way that depends on how much energy they have. So they end up getting fanned out into the constituent energies, which we see as colors to our eye. 
all through the classic rainbow, running from the lowest energy, light from red, all the way up to the violet. And in astronomy, we tend to think of things that are more towards one side as redder and things more to the other side as, we, we should say bluer, partly because purpler sounds a little bit silly, uh, but also for, for a more technical reason that our eyes, and it's a good excuse anyway, that our eyes are actually not very, very sensitive to purple. And so, you know, something that would be very, very purple, you know, sort of peaking in the purple in the night sky will actually tend to see more as blue. But this is just sort of a, an accident of where we happen to live and how we happen to have evolved. There is so much going on beyond that, you know, a whole universe of light and a whole universe of colors uh, from the very lowest energies, from the radio, this is just different views of the Andromeda galaxy, sort of our nearest big galaxy neighbor. And we see you know, in the radio, uh, we see shine from uh, all of the, uh, the hydrogen, these clouds of gas, cool glass, yeah, sorry, gas that will condense to form stars, you know, to the, the nurseries of what will become uh, tomorrow's uh, massive stars. In the infrared, we see dust, fine grain dust produced by, uh, you know, late, the late stages of stars and by supernovae uh, and sort of the, the granular seeds of what will become tomorrow's planets. And in the visible, of course, we see everything that we would, you know, are sort of accustomed to seeing with our eye, all, you know, the great uh, uh, panoply of stars in a galaxy that sort of look like our sun. Uh, but if we move to the ultraviolet, we see the very most massive stars, uh, in, you know, particularly sticking out. All of these things that will uh, uh, create the black holes and the neutron stars of tomorrow when they collapse and it goes supernovae when they die. Uh, we also see some of the remnants of lower mass stars, things that, you know, look like what our sun will look like in a few billion years as it exhausts its nuclear fuel and puffs off its outer envelopes, the planetary nebulae, uh, and eventually the white dwarfs uh, in a galaxy. And in the X-rays, the very highest energies, we see the uh, uh, you know, superheated gas, million degree gas blown out by uh, you know exploding uh, supernovae. Uh, and we see uh, extremely high energy matter falling into uh, black holes and accreting onto neutron stars, all kinds of just amazing things. So if we confine ourselves to the visible, we lose everything to the left and everything to the right in this diagram. But for all of those things, we need to go to space. And the reason is actually, to some extent, the same reason we can see within a relatively narrow range to begin with. Uh, it's not just because of you know, efficiency or some such like that in evolution's part. This is actually the, you know, one of the few approximate windows, uh, as we call them, atmospheric windows in which our atmosphere is uh, relatively transparent to light. If you go to higher energies, as Ben was saying in the, in the introduction, um, in the ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays, our atmosphere stops those dead, which is a good thing because otherwise they'd be roasting us. <laughs> uh, but it's very, very annoying if you want to observe any of that light. Um, and so things like ozone will, will, will absorb very, very strongly all that ultraviolet light. And if we want to look sort of redward, uh, there's again a forest of different uh, uh, absorption bands that, you know, there are a few windows where you can observe uh, um, a little, little bit if you find a way to get up through most of the atmosphere. Uh, but overall, it's a, it's a very daunting thing. You can, for the most part, you really can't get anywhere until you get all the way down to the radio, which is you know, it's a huge area, which is very transparent. And it's, of course, no coincidence that this is where uh, most of our communications are. So the other, so, so as I said, you know, for some bands, you know, it can help a little bit. And even, even if you look within the visual, actually, it's not all the way uh, uh, transparent. There is some rather troubling opacity. And so it's really, really advantageous if you can get high up. And this is why astronomers, one of the reasons that astronomers like to put all of our telescopes up on the tops of mountaintops like Mauna Kea, and you see over to the side here, just a little bit cut off, um, uh, Gemini North and uh, the Canada-France Hawaii telescope, uh, uh, major Canadian investments. But another reason that you want to get high, high up is you're trying to get above a lot of these turbulent clouds. You're trying to get somewhere that's very high, very dry, uh, and the reason for that is the other key problem uh, uh, that you have when you're trying to look through an atmosphere, uh, which is that the air is very turbulent. 
as you may have experienced, you know, the last time you flew, the last time you were in an airplane. Uh, and these random motions produce, you know, pockets of densities, of well, higher densities in the atmosphere that sort of act like little temporary fleeting lenses and prisms. Uh, and this slightly bends any light that's, you know, on a path towards us, you know, gives us the, the twinkling that you observe in any point sources, any stars in the night sky. And these produce distortions that make a, you know, really put a fundamental limit on uh, uh, the, the resolution of any, any kind of observation that we might be able to make from the ground. Here's sort of a, a comparison. So on the left here, uh, a wider field of view and then zoomed in, we have Subaru, which is a, a cutting edge telescope, one of, the, one of the ones on Mauna Kea that I showed there. Um, it's an eight meter telescope, state of the art, and here's sort of what it can do for a distant galaxy. And you see, you basically just get a smudge versus Hubble telescope, it's actually, a, you know, a little bit over a, a quarter of the size of, of Subaru, but it's in space. It doesn't have to look through our atmosphere. And so it doesn't have these distortions. Um, and so if we zoom in, you know, we look at a galaxy and we can see it in extraordinary detail, uh, little bands where stars are forming, how those all connect with densities of gas. We can look in detail at the inner lives of a galaxy. And one way that I like to sort of you know, visualize this, understand, you know, well, well, why is that important? Why do we really need this kind of kind of resolution? You know, try to imagine you're a, you're a city planner and you're trying to analyze traffic, for instance, right? On the left-hand side, all you have is a dot on a map and a few statistics, total population, average, uh, wait times and the average commute, say, in traffic. On the right-hand side, you have a live map of the city where you can follow traffic and spot exactly where the problems are happening and exactly why they're arising. It's just night and day. We can learn so much more about how our universe works when we can actually see it in detail. So Hubble has been able to do amazing things with this uh, this extraordinary resolution, this extraordinary sensitivity that it had, of course, and it, it's it's privileged position in space, and it's been doing it for thirty years. Uh, I think that one of the most amazing things that Hubble has done, certainly one of the the, the boldest experiments uh, that it that it ever uh, uh, embarked on, was to pick a patch of the night sky. Nothing too terribly special about it, except there wasn't really anything in the way, and it was a completely, you know, as far as astronomers knew, a dark patch of sky, nothing going on. Let's take the best telescope we've ever been able to put in space and look at that blank patch of, spot, of sky for 100 hours over 300 odd exposures. And let's see if it really is empty. And of course, we now know it's not. Any which way you look in the galaxy, in, in the universe, if you just look deeply enough, a long enough exposure, sensitive enough to see those things that are really, really far away. The universe is teeming with galaxies. Uh, each of these points a galaxy, each one of them, billions and billions of stars and probably around them, many, many planets. It's, it's, it's amazing to think about this, all in a patch of darkness. And Hubble has been able to do a number of other amazing things in its lifetime. Uh, it's been able to, you know, Tracking the 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 uh, motions of supernovae, uh, the the re relative velocities to, uh, uh, towards us uh, or away from us, as the case may be, of supernovae across cosmic distances, it was able to show that the universe isn't just expanding; that expansion is actually accelerating. Uh, there is some kind of dark energy, some additional property of the universe that's pushing everything apart on the grandest scales. Uh, it was also very fortuitously in space. You know, with just a few years leeway, just in time to watch uh, uh, Sh Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 slam into Jupiter, giving extraordinary uh, you know, insight into uh, 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 impacts in our solar system, something that we wouldn't have been able to do if Hubble, you know, to, the ex to the extent that we were able to, if Hubble wasn't in space. So really a, a strong argument there for no, you know, not losing capacity at any given moment to be able to make these kinds of measurements uh, uh, in space astronomy. But great as it was, it has been about 30 years now, a little bit over, and Hubble is starting to get on and it's starting to show its age. It's actually falling in its orbit, dangerously so, 
Uh, there have been talk. There has been talk of uh, you know a mission to try to push it back up uh, into a higher orbit, give it another long lease on life. But the the other problem is is that because it's getting on, a lot of its instruments are are starting to suffer uh, random failures. Nothing that we haven't been able to sort of you know the very clever people haven't been able to engineer their way around yet for the most part. Uh, but it's sort of universally agreed. In fact, it is universally agreed that that Hubble's days are 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 numbered, even if we don't know exactly what the number will be. And so we, we can't count on Hubble being in space that much longer. So what other telescopes do we have in space now? And, 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 and what new telescopes are planned or on the horizon? What are we thinking about? Well, the answer is, you know, there's a few right now, and there's a lot that are on the horizon. I'll talk about just a couple. So of course, we've heard an awful lot about the James Webb Space Telescope, and rightly so. This is, you know, Hubble was able to observe in the infrared, in the optical, has been able to observe in the infrared, the optical, and in the ultraviolet. But the successor to Hubble in the infrared is absolutely the James Webb Space Telescope. Much, much bigger collecting area uh, than Hubble, uh, which means it can look that much fainter, that much more sensitively towards far and distant objects. Um, and it's been able you know, to produce just astonishing results already. We've seen a few sort of a nice highlight reel of some of the things, really a, a triumph of space astronomy. Uh, from looking at stellar nurseries in the, in the top right here, the births of stars, uh, uh, to the deaths of stars, the last gasps of stars like our own sun, but many billions of years, a few billion years ahead of, uh, of ours in terms of its evolution, um, to looking at you know, vast cosmic collisions of galaxies here in Stefan's Quintet. Uh, the upper one here has a supermassive black hole in it. We've been able to learn a lot about how these grow already, about how these objects uh, are, are growing uh, uh, with time. Uh, and of course, its own deep field image sort of, in some sense, replicating a little bit of the work of, uh, of um, uh, the Hubble deep field image that I showed earlier, but in a fraction of the time. But there's a tricky thing about, uh, about James Webb. If there is one failing that you might uh, suggest, it's that it has a very, very narrow field of view. This is a you know, design choice. You need to optimize for some things over others. If you think about the area on the sky, these are big, these are close, close zoom ups in every instance. The area on the sky for most of these things, some of them are tiled, but for, for other you know, point sources, you could, you know, for it's not points, but smaller objects, you could blot these out holding a, a grain of sand at arm's length, right? These are, uh, uh, you know, actually very, very small areas of the sky for the most part. So what we really need, you know, is wide field instruments at the same time. Things that maybe can't go as we can't look as sensitively, can't look as deeply, but can look over a wider area of the sky in order to really take a census of galaxies and uh, 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 look for rare objects like unusual explosions in the night, cosmic explosions uh, in the night sky. And so uh, uh, one of the telescopes that's being proposed that can sort of advance on this front is the Euclid uh, Space Telescope that's being built by uh, the European, led by the European Space Agency, uh, named for the famous mathematician of, of uh, ancient times, of course. Um, it's going to be looking over a much larger field of view, but again, a little bit shallower. There's also the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. This is led by NASA and is a similar effort. Uh, Euclid is going to be mainly focusing on uh, under, trying to understand dark energy uh, and how it maybe is evolving, maybe not across the history of the cosmos. Roman is going to be looking into that, but also into a number of other things, looking for uh, planets in our own backyard and, and other things like that. Uh, Roman named for uh, NASA's first um, uh, uh, chief of astronomy, uh, really also considered the, the mother of the Hubble Space Telescope in many, many ways, really led that project. But there's a problem and you maybe noticed, maybe haven't. I skimmed over it a little bit. JWST is an infrared telescope. Euclid is an infrared telescope. Roman is an infrared telescope. We're really, really built up on the infrared. That's just one side <laughs> of the spectrum. Now, why that happened is a bit complicated, and it had in part to do with some priorities, but in large part, uh, 
well, to understand it, you need to understand that telescopes take a very, very, especially space telescopes, take a very, very long time to be built. Uh, and when these projects were started, when James Webb was started, when Euclid was started, when Roman was started, it was sort of could be taken for granted that it seems like Hubble is going to have a very, very long life ahead of it. <laughs> now we're nearing the end of Hubble's lifetime. And what we really need is something that can pick up the, you know, take up the torch on the bluer side, as astronomers would say, or the purpler side, this is probably more correct, uh, on the ultraviolet side of the spectrum, uh, and also extending even into the, the bluer sides of the, of the optical. And we really do need this. It's not a matter of, oh, well, maybe everything that's interesting is happening in the infrared right now. We need the ultraviolet in order to understand and, and answer key questions about why stars explode, how black holes get so big, especially the supermassive black holes that we now know are at the heart of every galaxy. Uh, and also just really fundamental questions about the ultimate fate of the universe, so much more. So what we really need in the face of a soon to retire Hubble is a new telescope. And so this is something that has you know, been in the works in Canada actually for a very long time, something that Canada looked at as a niche that we could sort of take the lead on, uh, going all the way back at least officially to the uh, 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 tw to 2011 and the, the release of the long range plan 2020, this sort of decadal plan that the Canadian astronomy community puts out uh, every 10 years to sort of decide, well, what would we really like to focus on? What do we think the priorities are for our community uh, over the next many years? And you know, after a long gestation over the last decade, the most recent long-range plan in 2020 announced that we're ready. We can do this. Our highest recommendation, and I'm quoting now, is for CASTER, a Canadian flagship space telescope that will be you know, a successor to Hubble in the UV, but that would also be a wide field of space telescope. Hubble also, like James Webb, had a very, very tiny footprint. Uh, on the night sky. This would be Hubble at a grand scale. And so to put that in sort of more specific terms, I'll start with a little astronomy, you know, very, very specific astronomy speak and then try and try and uh, build out what I mean by each of these in turn. Well, we're talking about something that can cover 0.25 square degrees of the night sky in a single pointing with Hubble-like resolution, just a, a, maybe a little, little bit worse, 0.15 arc seconds. It's going to be able to simultaneously view in three bands, three colors, in the UV, the ultraviolet, in the U, and in the G bands, uh, to a depth of uh, 27 AV mag uh, in each, uh, getting there in just about 600 seconds, so just a fraction of what its orbit is going to be, which is about an hour and a half. It's going to have an ultra-high precision photometer, uh, 10 parts per million. That's going to be perfect for hunting for planets uh, around distant stars, uh, and it's going to have uh, two different modes for spectroscopy so that we can actually look at how much light is coming in at different wavelengths at different energies and learn an awful lot more about the objects uh, that we're observing. What does all that mean? Well, in more, you know, plain spoken language. Well, when we're talking about 27th mag magnitude, we're talking about something that is uh, about 100 billion times fainter or so than the brightest stars in the night sky than Sirius and Vega. Uh, when we talk about, uh, let's see here, a wide field of view, 0.25 square degrees is you know, roughly the size of the full moon. And so here, just for comparison, this is again, you know, our nearest big galaxy neighbor, uh, M31 Andromeda. There was a, an enormous legacy program that Hubble undertook many, many, many hours trying to tile out mapping just a portion, just about a quarter, maybe more like a third, of the Andromeda galaxy. Teeny, teeny bit by bit, piece by piece. Castor is going to be able to do the same kind of project in six pointings, to the same depth and with roughly the same resolution, an enormous boost in survey efficiency. And that means an enormous boost in discovery efficiency. 
And it really is going to be the first telescope in the UV that can provide this kind of resolution over a wide field of view, over a large area of the night sky. The last, you know, really flagship wide field UV telescope that we had was GALAX. This was a NASA-led mission. And here is roughly what a large, what, what, what uh, uh, GALAX images look like over a wide field of view. You see a lot of smudges. Here is what Castor is going to be able to see over the same roughly field of view uh, as simulated. Think back to what I was talking about before. Think back to a you know comparison of ground-based to space-based. It's almost, it's a, roughly the same jump. We're going to be able to study in extraordinary detail huge numbers of galaxies and understand why they form stars, how they form stars, and why they stop forming stars when they do. Put another way to sort of put this in context, all of this uh, uh, photometry, all of these different uh, uh, bands, these different colors that Castor is going to be looking at. Here is sort of in his, uh, uh, the different uh, wavelength ranges that Castor is going to be look at, looking at versus uh, the other wide field infrared uh, telescopes, Roman and Euclid, as well as the JWST. And you see it, it's a perfect complement. So wavelength, this is in, you know, scientist units here in wavelength, but 0.4 to 0.7 or so, uh, that's roughly the human vision range, visible visible light, the optical. And you see that that's you know, roughly right in the middle of that is where Castor and Roman and Euclid meet. Uh, but Castor extends our vision, extends astronomers' vision into the blue, into the purple, into the ultraviolet, most importantly, the ultraviolet that we cannot do from the surface of the Earth. We also have these complicated sounding things, UV moss and grism. What are, what, are, what, are, what are these? Well, these are spectroscopic instruments. Again, these let us break down light from an object into its constituent, very, very precisely defined colors, its energies. And we can study how much is coming, how much light is coming in at different energies and reveal, you know, extraordinary details about the objects that we're looking at. Um, there'll actually be two such instruments. Uh, there'll be a, a GRISM instrument, which basically gives us a low resolution spectrum, uh, sort of a coarse spectrum of every object in the field of view. And there's also going to be uh, the multi-object spectrum, a UV multi-object spectrometer, which is going to let us choose a number of targets for higher resolution spectroscopy. Now, why would you want spectroscopy? Well, here's an example from a, a Canadian contribution. Uh, to the JWST, actually from the nearest instrument. This is one of the two uh, Canadian instruments on, on JWST. The other sort of paired with it is the fine guidance sensor that allows JWST to point with such accuracy. But nearest allows us to take uh, very you know, uh, unique kinds of spectra. Uh, and here's a spectrum that nearest took. This is led by the University of Montreal uh, astrophysics group along with their collaborators. Um, spectrum of the atmosphere of a planet around another star. And the where these, you know, this is just the wavelengths are the very, very uniquely defined colors. And the amount of light coming in, actually, it's framed in terms of an amount of light blocked. I can get into that <laughs> if you like. Um, but the key idea here is that these little dips and valley, any little little uh, peaks and valleys correspond to um, uh, unique signatures of elements and molecules like potassium and water and carbon monoxide. Castor is going to be able to extend this to the blue and into the ultraviolet, allowing us to look for uh, unique signatures like ozone, things that we need to confirm truly Earth-like planets around other stars. So this is a huge undertaking that's been growing, as I said, for many, many years. Uh, there are many, many partners across Canada. It really is a pan-Canadian effort leading this telescope. Uh, so of course, uh, it's being led right here at NRC, so I'm a science co-lead. Patrick Cote is the principal investigator, and we also have uh, John Hutchings, who's a science co-lead. Um, but this is in partnership with the Canadian Space Agency and with 20 universities across the country. Uh, we also have a number of big industry partners, uh, Honeywell and uh, Magellan uh, and ADB are all contributing key, comp are all going to be contributing likely key components. So uh, Magellan, of course, famously has sort of a, uh, a um, a um, 
cutting edge bus, sort of like a chassis, a framework for the telescope, Honeywell and ABB. They work on the uh, uh, optics and the electronics. And we have a number of international partners as well. This is a Canadian led mission, but we're not going in alone. And so uh, JPL uh, and NASA, as well as uh, the UK Space Agency, uh, have expressed uh, uh, in discussions now to sort of contribute to the development of the cutting edge detector, the most sensitive de uh, UV detector that is ever going to be, uh, ever have been, not ever going to be, but ever have been put in space. Uh, and the Indian Space Research Organization is also collaborating with us on a number of things. And this is in part uh, due to actually our sort of extended le extensive legacy of working um, with the uh, uh, Indian uh, space community, and in particular, uh, collaborating on the AstroSat telescope, which is a, it's an Indian-led uh, X-ray telescope that's in space right now. But uh, most people haven't heard. There's actually a, a significant Canadian contribution to this. We, we contributed a um, sort of a, a prototype, as it were, almost a, 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 um, a smaller scale UV detector as sort of a, uh, you know, dipping our toe in the water for getting into this space-based UV astronomy and getting, you know, a stepping stone towards getting ready for Castor. And so India is going to be uh, uh, you know, quite likely contributing the, the launch vehicle, at least that's what we're, the assumption we're currently uh, operating under, uh, that's going to be uh, putting Castor in a sort of a unique orbit, a sun-synchronous uh, near-polar orbit. And I can get into why that would be, why that is uh, the way it is uh, in the questions, if you like. Uh, the current plan for the launch date is about 2029. Um, there, of course, you need, you know, there can be delays in launches. It may be plus or minus a year, but that's more or less where we're aiming for. And in the planned lifetime is at least five years, although we have a goal of 10, maybe even 15 years of operations. How am I doing on time, Ben? Yeah, okay, perfect. So as I said, we've got about 20 plus universities across the country that are contributing to developing uh, both the, you know, the mission plan and also the, the science case for Castor, what questions we're going to be able to solve. And so we have people you know, right across the country uh, developing, you know, developing this right now as part of the phase zero study that's sort of most of the way through now, wrapping up by May. Uh, this is a, a process where basically the science community and industry iterate back and forth um, uh, talking with each other to make sure we're all on the same page. You know, these are the things we want to do scientifically. This is what the instrument can do. Circling until we make sure everybody's happy. <laughs> we have what we need to do the science we want to do. And so just, you know, amazing science that we are going to be able to do, you know, mapping, you know, un understanding dark matter and dark energy, uh, understanding the, the lives and deaths of stars, looking for extrasolar planets and characterizing them, understanding if they really are Earth-like, mapping supermassive black holes across cosmic distances, and, and at the same time, the outer solar system uh, uh, around our own our own star. Just, just incredible breadth of science, really a multi-purpose tool. And so, you know, building on that, as we try to decide, you know, okay, what do we need Castor to be able to do? Uh, this has sort of started to evolve towards, a, you know, shaping up about 16, we think now, uh, legacy surveys that Castor is going to be undertaking, you know, major campaigns. Uh, there'll also be time for, for what we call guest observing. So, you know, if you've got a good idea, you can send in a proposal. Hey, it would be amazing if Castor could look at this. We'll, we'll be, we'll, we'll, you know, uh, it'll be evaluated by a committee and, if it passes, Castor will look at it. But there's also going to be 16 dedicated programs that are doing things that we know we need Castor to be able to do. Huge projects like the Legacy Survey for Astrophysics and Cosmology, which is going to su survey a vast area of the night sky overlapping with what Roman and, and Euclid are going to be looking at, providing ultraviolet measurements in, the, you know, in, the, in those areas. Um, a target of opportunity mission, rapidly responding to cosmic explosions, and the list goes on and on and on. I think it's it's best if we look at it, just a, a couple of examples, focusing in on that target of opportunity mission, and you know slowing down for a minute if I've got the time. Supernova science is you know at the heart of the foundations of, astro of modern astronomy in many ways. Uh, this month actually marks the 450th anniversary of Tycho's supernova, an explosion, a new light in the night sky, which was identified by, by Tycho Brahe, an astronomer working in, in, in Denmark uh, in, in the 1500s. Uh, 
who showed that this was, you know, not this couldn't be some atmospheric phenomenon. This was genuinely an explosion in the, you know, in the distant universe. And since then, we've come to learn that these, you know, cosmic explosions like this actually produce all of the, you know, heavy elements uh, that are essential for, you know, rocky planets and life. It's amazing uh, how important, you know, these, these seemingly distant, uh, uh, you know, catastrophic events are. Right now, one of the most exciting topics and things that go boom in the night in these cosmic explosions is these things called kilonovae that are the mergers of a, of a pair of neutron stars, object, you know, the dead remnants of massive stars. They're so dense that, you know, it's the mass, a little bit more uh, than the mass of our sun, 1.4 times the mass of our sun, compressed into an area that could fit within greater Victoria. You know, a spoonful of it would weigh an incredible amount of tons and tons. When two of these merge, they create an extraordinary explosion that we think may be responsible for a lot of the more exotic heavy elements. In particular, it probably makes a lot of the gold and platinum in the universe. We don't know yet for sure. We can find these things going off now, you know, through a variety of different means. Most astonishingly, we can get, you know, really up to the minute word that, uh, that an explosion like this has happened from gravitational wave observatories. These mergers are so powerful that they create ripples in space-time itself that, you know, incredibly faint, but thanks to you know, some truly heroic uh, sensitive measurements, you know, uh, and the technological development, we can now measure these gravitational waves passing by Earth. The gravitational waves tell us a lot. They tell us about the masses of these neutron stars. They tell us kind of roughly where it happened and how far away they are. But they don't tell us about are these actually producing all of the, the gold and the platinum that we that, that we think they're making and things like that. We need a telescope that can spin around and look at these. Uh, and we actually need one that can do it within, you know, a very, very short time span, within hours in order to really get a slam dunk measurement and understand, yes, this is definitely, you know, discriminate between our, our models and, and, and determine, okay, this actually is producing a lot of this element. And so Castor is going to be able to do these kind of measurements. You need them in the ultraviolet. You need them within a two hour turnaround, which is what Castor is going to be able to do or better. And it's also going to be able to follow up. This is one particular type of explosion, but there'll be many, many others that, of course, Castor is going to be able to provide just vital information on that can reveal how all sorts of cosmic explosions happen track by tracking their, their first moments, sort of the, the first on the scene for, for any kind of crime scene investigation of these explosions. Castor is also going to be able to weigh about a, you know, in our initial planned campaign, about a thousand supermassive black holes across 10 million years of history. Light travels at a finite speed, it's not infinitely fast. So the further away we look, the further back in time we're looking, right? Because that's how long light has been taking to, to get to us. What we're going to do is by measuring, you know, all we really see when we see a supermassive black hole out at millions, billions of light years away is, uh, you know, is a point of light, right? But by studying how that point flickers, is one way to put it. The timing of those flickers betrays a key detail. It betrays the, um, uh, the, the size of the region, the gas around these supermassive black holes. And then looking at the spectrum, some of these unique features, and you look at how light is spread out across different energies, you can actually get the speed, the velocity of the gas around these black holes. But the size of the region and the speed, you can actually Astronomers can infer the mass of the black hole at the center of these gaseous regions spiraling into black holes. And that will allow us to do this. It's called reverberation mapping, and it's a unique technique for getting really precise measurements of the mass of supermassive black holes across billions of light years. Castor is also going to be putting that you know, wide field of view and high resolution to use, measuring the inner lives of the nearest thousand galaxies, something we call sort of the local volume, uh, you know, our, our nearest neighbors around the Milky Way, and understand, you know, 
how some galaxies seem to decide they're going to keep st forming stars and other galaxies don't. And what about the ones that are sort of in between and what makes them different? We're also going to be turning towards our own Milky Way and providing the definitive ultraviolet map of our cosmic backyard, uh, you know, piecing together uh, how stars form in our own Milky Way, but also uh, looking at the deaths of stars, looking at that uh, planetary nebulae, looking at a host of different objects. As I said earlier, Castor is also going to be charting the furthest reaches of our solar system, looking for trans-Neptunian objects, these Kuiper belt objects, and even further out, icy bodies that are sort of some of the last traces of the earliest stages of development uh, of our solar system that are still, still left around. Uh, probably these outer reaches were, you know, the source of the water on planets like Earth and the ancient past Mars uh, kicked in from dynamical interactions and then impacting on Earth. We can get a, you know, a little, we can start to piece together what that must have looked like by looking at these outermost solar system bodies. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, Castor is also going to be able to confirm the Earth-like nature or not of planets orbiting other stars, investigating their atmospheres and understanding their composition. They're going to be able to tell us what these worlds are really like. So I could go on and on, but maybe it's best if I sort of stop there and leave some time for questions. But I'll just summarize by saying, you know, Castor remains Canada's number one priority in space astronomy. Uh, this is something that uh, we've this been in development for a long time. As I said, it's in its phase zero, so we're still iterating between science and industry. Um, but the plan is to, to sort of put together a coherent package that can be uh, put to the Canadian government for you know, final, final funding and everything like that. Uh, we're looking at sometime uh, uh, sort of next year or maybe in early 2024 for that. It's going to be a powerful uh, uh, technology driver for Canada's space sector. Um, you know, something that I didn't get into too, too much, but you know, you might ask sort of what's the what's the practical application here at home for all of this? Uh, and, you know, I'm an astronomer, I'm biased. I think that it's just in interesting enough to be understanding, you know, the origins of cosmic explosions and the growth of supermassive black holes. Uh, but if you can build detectors that can look out across the stars, you can build them to look at our Earth as well. And it's an amazing stimulus for the space industry in our country, uh, just a, a increasingly clearly vital industry that can provide, you know, incredible benefit to agriculture, to climate studies, uh, to, to um, uh, mining and other development, uh, not to and communications as well. The list goes on and on. Um, Castor itself is going to provide an unprecedented tool for unlocking the secrets of the cosmos for all of the reasons I said and more. Um, and I think, you know, close to my heart, it's going to be a flagship mission for Canada. We have made outstanding contributions uh, to other telescopes uh, that have been sent into space in the past, including particularly the James Webb Space Telescope most recently, uh, of which we should be particular, of which we should be, you know, very, very proud. Uh, but for the first time, a flagship with multi-purpose mission. We've had sort of niche, small instruments that we've sent into space that we've led, but a flagship, all-purpose tel space telescope uh, for Canada, which I think uh, is a really amazing thing. I'll stop there. Thank you, Tyrone. Um, I'm going to be self-indulgent a bit. Having been involved ultraviolet astronomy in the 90s. Uh, I'm tempted to ask, where were you back then? But then I think I know. <laughs> it's in grade school, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, one of the things that I, you know, we, we were looking at back then was stellar populations in the ultraviolet, um, which, um, and, and one of the arguments for doing this was, well, how the hell do we understand the observations of James Webb at higher redshift and other telescopes if we don't understand the local populations in the ultraviolet um, because they're going to get redshifted over to the optical and, and beyond That's right. um, and so uh, in particular there are a number of features that are in the ultraviolet that aren't available anywhere else um, so uh, are you working you guys looking at that I didn't see that too much in the list yeah, so I didn't I didn't get too far into the weeds on that, but no. So so stellar populations are definitely something that we're interested in. Uh, there's a there's a whole stars science working group that's uh, that's working on this. 
Uh, one of the one of the first things that we're we're going to be looking for is um, uh, finding the most massive white dwarfs. Uh, you know, and we're, with Castor, we're going to be able to do that in star clusters out in the Magellanic clouds. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, um, as you go, you know, for for the wider audience, you know, Ben, but <laughs> as you go from low mass stars up to about eight times the mass of the sun, you you know, the final fate is going to be something that looks like a white dwarf, you know, that, that blows off its outer layers relatively gently, not in a supernova. Um, and leaves behind sort of a lump, a hot lump of um, uh, carbon and oxygen leftovers from, from nuclear burning. Um, somewhere above eight times the mass of our sun, you start to make neutron stars and black holes, but the boundary between those is really, really still needs to be refined. And so finding the most massive white dwarfs really helps us pin down exactly where that transition is. Uh, another thing that Castor is going to be doing a lot of uh, is looking uh, generally trying to understand the impact of binary stellar populations. So something that really, really worries um, a lot of people who work in, uh, in in not just stellar astronomy, but also who study galaxies as well. You know, we have these ways of trying to model, trying to understand the combined spectra of galaxies. Uh, you know, we think of it as, a well, it's a lot of stars spectra added up, plus gas, plus others, whatnot. Um, a lot of these models would assume that all of the stars live in isolation their whole lives. But of course, we actually know from looking at our Milky Way that about half of the points of light you see in the night sky, you know, roughly, uh, are binary stars. You know, if you remember Star Wars, Tatooine is the norm, not the exception. And so, you know, studying binaries and trying to understand, you know, the lives of, of you know, particular massive binary stars closer to home uh, can tell us a lot about how this, you know, changes the picture, impacts the, the integrated light of galaxies that we can see, you know, looking out to the things that James Webb is looking at, these distant objects. So that and a hundred other things we can do that can help us sort of calibrate uh, uh, our understanding of the local universe so that we can under, you know, understand and better interpret what's going on in these, these distant objects that James Webb is seeing. Yeah, just to, just to add to that, you know, one, yeah. of the, one of the cool things that we noticed back then was that uh, all of, the, all of the, um, the bluest light from the background population, not, not the exotic stuff like white dwarfs, <laughs> but just regular main sequence stars, um, that was, that shone up in the ultraviolet um, you know, up to like 2,500 angstroms or so. Um, and if you can get good resolution spectroscopy at that range, you might well be able to do something interesting in, in stellar populations. Absolutely. Uh, another thing that just uh, I realized I skimmed over and I didn't talk about talking about uh, blue light from, from otherwise, you know, normalish stars. Um, right. Another thing that we are going to be looking at, so the most, you know, the more common star, uh, stars in the universe are sort of these, these M dwarfs. Um, and it's thought, well, since they're very, very common, and since we know that they have planets, maybe these are good places for life. They live a very long time. They have a very, you know, well-defined, stable region where, where um, um, uh, they have enough light in order to keep the planets warm and so they can be habitable. But we also know that these stars have very strong flares. We don't have enough information to characterize it, but they have these bright ultraviolet flares from their coronae uh, that could roast if <laughs> these otherwise habitable worlds. And so one of the things that we need to understand in order to understand you know, how many Earth-like planets are there out in the universe uh, is to understand these uh, ultraviolet flares around these M dwarf stars. And that's something that Castor is actually going to have a dedicated uh, survey program most likely uh, uh, working on. Uh, we have a question from the chat. Um, uh, how big is how big will the telescope actually be? Right, so it's going to be a, a one meter aperture is the short answer. Uh, the actual frame around it and everything is going to be a bit bigger. Uh, the principal investigator for the mission had a, a good way of visualizing it, uh, Pat Cote. It's about a Toyota Tercel. <laughs> <laughs> but the telescope itself will be a one meter aperture. <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, do other people have other questions that they'd like to ask? This That was amazing, um, uh, <laughs> Doctor. Thank you. I, I, I mean, I had heard of this, you know, for quite a long time, but didn't realize how 
how uh, how massive uh, a program it was going to be. And I think, as you say, we sometimes are quite humble in what we <laughs> in what we do uh, here in Canada, and uh, we don't make a big deal out of ourselves. So, just my last question would be for you: Is are there other UV telescopes, space telescopes that are going up that are going to be competitors to this? So that's a great question. There have always been great questions, but that, that's actually something that we've been actively thinking about right now because uh, sort of some, some other telescopes that are looking at a similar space have just recently been announced. Um, so in particular, the U.S. is looking right now, there's actually a competition in the U.S. between two different telescopes that they're thinking of funding that would operate partly in, you know, one of them entirely and one of them partly in the UV, but they do very different things. Uh, so depending on which one they choose, one of them is way more about, you know, it has actually a, a smaller UV camera and mainly has an X-ray camera, and it's about quickly swinging around to find these cosmic explosions whenever they go off. Um, but it's not, you know, the, the UV part is very secondary. I think it's a, a I can't remember. It's a, it's a 30 centimeter. It's a much smaller, uh, smaller uh, UV telescope. Um, the other one is uh, looking in the UV and in the uh, far UV, but much shallower actually than Castor is going to, uh, for the astronomers in the audience, by about uh, two magnitudes uh, uh, shallower than, than Castor is going to be able to do. And the idea with that one is it's just swinging around the whole sky all the time, uh, trying, to, trying to look at the whole sky uh, over a very short period of time. Uh, but it doesn't, you know, not going to be able to do the kind of, you know, targeted missions that Castor is going to do or get to the depth that Castor is going to be able to get to. So even if one of those missions is chosen, I think that um, uh, mm -hmm. Castor is still going to be, well, frankly, humanity's foremost ultraviolet telescope. There's just nothing that's going to be able to do what Castor is going to be able to do. And I think, uh, I think uh, the kind of ambition that we're trying to trying to advance here with Castor is very worthwhile. Well, thank you very much. That was just wonderful. And uh, we really appreciate your time that you've given to no. uh, to um, have you have you do this for us. And uh, we'll we'll have to I mean, uh, 2029 is still a little bit away. So, <laughs> a little bit. so, um, so we'll have to um, have to have you back um, maybe sometime next year in order to kind of give us an update and where we Absolutely. are. Absolutely. And it's so nice to see some of the names of those people that were on that on that list because they were, you know, we, <laughs> right. you know, we we know some of them, you know, so that's really that's nice right. to do that. So that's great. Yeah, thank no, you th so much again. I really appreciate it. Um, oh, and thank you very much for having me. It's always you. a pleasure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch over now to our uh, to our astro imaging part of the evening, and and as I said before, we haven't really done this for a while um, at all uh, because we've been so uh, interested in just keeping everybody happy up at the center that we haven't had a lot a lot of time just to kind of sit and really uh, look at some of the really beautiful images that have been taken. So I'd like to just ask, um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, David Lee and David Payne and Brock. And I just wanted to just say before we start that um, David Payne is already one of our, uh, one of our directors of the Friends of the DAO. And Brock Johnson has just been uh, in our in our last meeting that we had um, uh, in uh, November uh, or sorry, October that we that we had uh, that he has been also made a, a director of um, the FDAO. And we're very happy to have um, uh, both of these expert astrophotographers on board. I mean, our next thing is to try to get David Lee on, but, you know, he keeps saying no. So, you know, what can we do anyway? Um, but uh, I'm going to dro drop it over to David in order to kind of get going and we can, uh, and we can just see some of these beautiful astrophotog astro, astro photographs. There we go. Great. Uh, thank you, Lori. Um, we had such an amazing summer. I, I, I just want to tell you, I, I don't think I remember a that long a stretch of uh, clear nights so but of course it, everything has to come to an end and but tonight um we we have um quite a number of images uh hopefully not too many but uh, uh they they span from things that are really close to us like the moon uh and then going all the way out into deep space so um uh, we we've been busy uh actually 
uh, Brock and uh, Dave have been more busy than me. But uh, uh, I think I'll just start off uh, by just talking a little bit about the uh, total lunar eclipse that happened at the beginning of November. Uh, certainly, we were not um, uh, we were not uh, feeling very good about it because uh, we were totally socked in, and uh, it. I think most of us decided on the Monday night that uh, we would watch this uh, virtually on on the internet, which I did as well. Uh, except um, I couldn't pass up the chance to just try. So I'm, I'm just going to share my screen here. Can everybody see my screen? Great. Uh, so um, I was watching Time and Date. I think it must have been around 1 o'clock I started watching. And then I thought, well, I wonder what it's doing outside. And of course, it was it was quite cloudy. But I, I went outside and I had a look. And I could actually kind of see the moon like it was kind of coming in and out of the clouds. So I decided at that point I would take the take the chance. Um, you, you you can't win unless you play. So um, I, I grabbed my um, my unit, and you can tell this this is my neighborhood. Um, it was uh, covered in kind of a icy snow, and I dragged out my telescope, or not my telescope. I dragged out my photographic telephoto on a tracker, and the reason why I did that was um, the uh, exposures during a, an eclipse can be quite dim. So I thought, well, if I'm going to use 630 millimeters of focal length, then I probably should be able to back it up with uh, uh, with some tracking. So uh, the the uh, the persistence actually did pay off, and uh, there were holes in the cloud. And then just shortly right after the total eclipse started, I was able to image uh, the, the eclipse. So uh, I think um, I was probably as more amazed than even everybody else was because uh, it was quite windy and it was kind of cold, but I, I sat out there at the end of my driveway and waited. And uh, yeah, I, it, it was kind of impressive. I, I guess it was impressive for me because uh, I worked a little bit harder on this one than I have in, in the past. Uh, in the past, uh, the eclipses have been probably around six or seven o'clock in the evening. Uh, there's only been a few in my recollection that were at really odd hours. Uh, and, and this was certainly one of them, but it had that beautiful, rich uh, red color. And I think uh, my final note is, as I was packing up, I was able to actually see Mars above the clouds. And I think that's a really good segue uh, to uh, maybe uh, pass this over to Brock, uh, because basically uh, I was able to um, uh, see Mars. And, uh, and let me see if I can get pass this over. And if Brock wants to take the, the screen, he can show us an image of um, mm -hmm. Mars. Okay. Okay, let me see here. There we go. Can you guys see Mars? Yeah, can. Excellent. So, yeah, this was from October the 4th, I think it was. It was early in the morning. And I... I was wanting I'd been done doing a lot of imaging of Jupiter and Saturn but I really I knew that Mars was visible when I was going out in the dark to get the newspaper early in the morning and I was keen to get it so uh, one morning I went out and set up and the seeing was reasonable so I got a nice image uh, the reason I wanted to share this one tonight partly too was uh, because we're less than two weeks away from Mars being at opposition uh, with the weather we have, who knows if we'll even see it, but, you know, opposition, of course, is kind of like full Mars, you know, it's similar to a full moon. And right now, this the picture here is, of course, Mars on its way getting bigger, but it's, it's you know, I guess technically in the waxing phase. So, you know, it's not fully illuminated. But any time between now and, you know, Christmas, uh, Mars will be for all intents and purposes, very close to opposition, with the peak of that being on the 8th of December. And um, 
it'll be definitely if you can get out get a clear patch of sky the nice thing now is that it it's visible in the evening you don't have to stay up late you just have to be outside and have the odds of having a clear sky and you can either see it with your naked eye or you can get out a telescope or binoculars and get a little bit better view so yeah, yeah. i think it's also a perfect time as don said uh, you can actually see uh Aldebaran and uh also uh uh, see Betelgeuse possibly at the same time. Yes. Yeah, that that's actually an interesting little triangle there to be, I don't know if I have the field of view to get all three, but it's lots of interesting reddish colors there. And the other image that I have was um, I'd been doing some wide field viewing of the Heart Nebula and the interior of the Heart Nebula looked quite interesting to me. So I pointed my bigger telescope at it and uh, this is the the center of the Heart Nebula, which is um, IC 1805 in Cassiopeia. And um, it's basically the center area where the the young stars are forming. And and it's I just thought it was a very striking area with lots of glowing hydrogen and dust and gases that are and just the framing of it I thought was quite an interesting region. So I was glad to get that one. That was one of my favorites from the fall so far. So yeah, very nice, bro. And that's all I did for tonight, just because I know we were going to be a little tight on time. So mm -hmm. I think we could pass it over to David. Brock, can I just ask about the red, the real, the real, like the obviously predominance of red there rather than like blues and yes. Well, of course, that red is coming from hydrogen emissions. The, there's a lot of, because they're young stars, they form from hydrogen. And of course, there's still a lot of hydrogen that didn't turn into stars that's not dense enough or cold enough to, to condense down. And it's, it's um, being energized by the young stars. They're pumping out a lot of mm -hmm. high energy radiation, ultraviolet and what have you. And that's causing the hydrogen to to you know get uh, basically hydrogen electrons goes up and then falls back down and emits some photons and creates that nice sort of classic reddish hydrogen look and this is done in in similar to true color in that you know hydrogen does emit in the deep red so that is what i'm showing here i, I wouldn't be surprised if david payne has some images that show hydrogen in other colors uh, to highlight the various different gases. But in this case, I chose to go with the red to Thank represent you. it. Thank you. Okay, I think it's your turn, Dave. Yeah, thanks Thanks a lot for the segue. That's perfect. <laughs> um, I've been, uh, I'm fairly new to astronomy myself. Um, Am I showing the right screen here? Are you seeing a, a, a desktop? Page? We're seeing a desktop. We're oh. seeing, seeing some nice diving. <laughs> also a nice picture. Hmm. Click the wrong button. There we go. There we go. That's so I've been uh, rather obsessed this year uh, with stellar nurseries and uh, how stars are forming within them and what's what's going on. So I'm going to tell a little bit of story. This is a stellar nursery um, nicknamed the, the, the Tadpole uh, Nebula, IC410. It's quite a distance away. It's 12,000 light years away in Auriga. And if you can imagine, um, Initially, this molecular cloud um, sitting there in space, it's cold, it's uh, uh, shielded from, from within it, it's shielded from light from other stars, and gravity gradually takes over and uh, compresses this gas. And it compresses it kind of unevenly, and these knots might form in it of 
extra compressed gas. And as you compress this stuff more and more, it heats up just like your compressed gas in your um, heat pump does. Um, and eventually some of these knots will get so dense and warm enough that they'll ignite in fusion. And when that happens, instead of a gas moving in through gravity, all the light that it's getting off and solar winds, but mainly you know, UV radiation is gonna push that gas back away from the star. So it's gonna, instead of coming in, it's gonna start blowing, the stars are gonna start blowing that gas all away from them. And where there were knots of sufficient density, you get stars forming. So each one of these, um, most of these, uh, including in Brock's uh, image, you see a cluster of stars at the center. And the color in this image, you can see that the, the, a lot of the gas has been blown out. You're, you're looking at this at 3D, but you can imagine this rim of gas, this circular rim of gas, that's been blown out from those stars. And the parts that face the stars, they absorb a lot of that UV radiation and they convert it into visible light according to the composition of the gas. Again, hydrogen tends to dominate and hydrogen actually exists anywhere from the greens through to the oranges in this image, um, providing those dominant colors. The colors in the middle are provided by oxygen. And on the outer edge of these tends to be red, dominated by uh, sulfur colors. Now, why these gases get displaced in that order, I'm not sure. It could be partly due to the way we're looking at it. We're looking at a 2D image of a 3D object. But uh, you'll see this over and over again, the same pattern. And what you'll see is these nodules, in this case, they're two down here. These are the tadpoles from which the whole nebula gets its name. You see the part facing the stars is very, very bright as it absorbs and re-emits all that light. But behind that, it's actually, the gases are still shielded. And in fact, they're getting compressed, not just by gravity anymore, but by the sheer blowing of these gases away from the stars that have already been created. So this is gonna result into, in the creation of even more stars within these very dense fingerlets that the starlight is having a lot more trouble blowing away. Now before, I, so this image is colored so that we can see the actual composition of, of, the, of, the, of the stellar nursery of the nebula, but we can also look at it in a different sort of light Here we go. This is more a visible look, what you were getting at, Lori. This is a more um, the same brightness as the other image, but now you can see the dominance of hydrogen throughout the, the stellar nursery, throughout the nebula. Um, the other thing to note, you do see areas of blue. And what this is, is these blue stars, their light is being reflected off the dust that's there on the outer edges. So that blue is no longer representative of composition. It's more like the red light is getting emitted to us and the blue light is getting reflected to us. So it's just another view of the same thing. But it is remarkable as, as I've gone along through this to see how that same pattern occurs over and over again. And you can see there's a, generally a hole in the nebula where the original 
um, stars were formed. Um, and you can see that hydrogen is being pushed out further and oxygen in this blue area is pushed out less. Um, you can see these gas nodules sticking into the, the middle where additional stars are formed. Um, the one on the right is called the Rosette Nebula. It's uh, a lot closer than the previous one. It's only 5,000 um, um, light years away. Um, had to be taken with a smaller telescope to fit it in an image. And this one, it's called the elephant trunk, is only 2,000, 2,400 kilometers away. And that's taken with a rather wide field telescope to get the whole thing in one image. And you'll see a lot of images being produced of this little feature here. This is the elephant trunk. It's one of those nodules, just like the tadpoles. It's brightest on the part that's facing the stars the existing stars. And within it, we can actually see stars forming um, within the back of it. You'll also see some black splotches. And that's basically looking at these tadpoles or these elephant trunks or whatever you want to call these, these fingerlets pointing inwards. But we're looking at them from the backside. So that's why they appear as very dark splotches on here, um, because the light is actually not making it through their protective um, leading edges. So through things like this, I like to explore what's going on. And um, I'll leave, this, leave it at this final image here. Um, it is actually a close-up of one of these fingerlets or nodules. And again, you see it lit up very bright as it absorbs all that radiation. A lot of the gas around it has been blown away past it. And stars are, are likely forming within this shielded, still cold molecular cloud in here. Um, but that was only one of the reasons I, uh, I uh, took this one. With uh, the season coming, I, where did I rotate? What's happening? Can't rotate it. Um, here we go. There. It's upside down. No, it's right. It's known by three different names. One is the Fox Fur Nebula, because you see the gas has been pushed into a pattern down here that resembles a fur. And it actually has a, somewhat looks like a fox's head here. So there's the Fox Fur. The nebula, that uh, the, the, the cluster that's at the center of this is known as the Christmas tree cluster. But if you look at the star outline, you can see it outlines a bit of a Christmas tree. And the nebular gas itself outlines a little bit of a Christmas tree here. So you can uh, pull up your fox fur and sit at the base of the tree and uh, look it up the, the lighted Christmas tree. And even at the, the top, you've got a little bit of a, an angel or something. <laughs> Use your imagination a little bit. But uh, if there's any questions. Those are just, those are gorgeous. Just unbelievable. And if you, yeah. if you put them back out, like if you actually, you know, kind of came back out and took a wider field and a wider field and a wider field, it would end up being this dot, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that you wouldn't that you wouldn't ever see. I, I mean, I guess, you know, with a smaller telescope, uh, that you would not see this kind of detail whatsoever. Oh, on, on well, like well that. That, that's not completely true. Um, um, this one, this, this one uh, is actually um, only uh, 2300 light years away. <laughs> only it, it, and and it's it's a very it's a very close up of one of those tadpole type things 
So to get that close up, you, you do have to have a fairly sized telescope, but by no means do you have to do that for all the images. Um, of these two, the, the left um, image was taken by a very small telescope. Um, the camera lenses are bigger than the telescope used to take this one. And uh, the one on the right was a, a larger one, but, but uh, not extremely large. So you, you can actually take very good images and explore space with your camera with uh, fairly modest equi equipment. Excuse me. Yeah, the Rosette is actually um, quite a popular object uh, for maybe four to 600 millimeters, I guess. It's quite large, actually. Well, I mean, they vary. They're actually all of fairly similar scale within 50%. When you look at the entire stellar nursery, they're remarkably consistent in size. Um, the, the difference is how far away they are determines how much of the, the, the sky they, they take up. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, th thanks, David, thanks. for the uh, analysis of the uh, the nodules. I was always curious about them myself. So I, I think um, I think maybe we'll just close out tonight with uh, kind of a montage of galaxies uh, from the Plasket. I don't know if anybody is okay to comment on them. Uh, Dan's not with us tonight, but I, I will share the the montage with you. People are so always think, asking, what, what can we see with the plasket? Um, yeah, so the, 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 these, the, yeah. these are the big guns. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we, we've gone everywhere from my 600 millimeter uh, photographic lens uh, to the plasket. Now, I, I know that uh, Dan has, um, I won't spend too much time on this, but Dan has really had to do a lot of work uh, because uh, the Plaskett doesn't use uh, the traditional filters that we use uh, for astrophotography. They they use uh, photometric uh, Sloan filters. So he has to do a lot of translation to get them into these colors. David, we need to make these into posters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we just, should. just like we have posters that are, you know, from the J dot from the, or from, you know, CFHT and from Gemini. We need to have these on posters that we can, that we can, well, sell in the, sell in the, in the gift shop or, or, you know, put up because they're just beautiful. So. Yeah. It's, it's, it. it's, it's amazing the the breadth of imagery, like on this Island. And there's, there's even people that we don't really hear much from, but, they produce some pretty amazing work. There's some kind of closet kind of uh, astro imagers in the in the region as well. But well, yeah, um, absolutely you. amazing work. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to Brock and David and uh, and David uh, for bringing us that. Uh, look forward to seeing more. Um, and uh, to Aaron for helping us with the Ask an Astronomer. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, for Calvin, for man managing all the background uh, uh, with the YouTube and the Zoom. We really appreciate that. And again, for uh, Dr. Woods, who uh, gave a really fantastic talk tonight. So thank you to absolutely everybody. Ben, sorry, I forgot. I forgot Ben. Ben's out there somewhere. <laughs> oh, and Don. Oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, and Don. <laughs> so many people that we have to that we have to ask for all the people that helped out tonight. So uh, we look forward to seeing uh, seeing people again on December the 17th. And we hope that um, that after that, possibly in January and February, depending on what happens with the road, we might be back up at the center again and uh, we'll be able to see everybody in person. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining in tonight and uh, supporting the friends of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. Bye for now. Good night. Good night. Good night.